Okay, well, Jim, yeah, Jim started out with a couple of hints to shut off your cell phones. Uh, I'm not too concerned about that here, but you know, on presentations, it's a must. Of course, he, he had to reiterate. Um, so just a reminder. Of the, and then he, Jim, Jim's got a, a sense of humor. He's, you know, so he's quoting Yoda here. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. He says, I've witnessed more people leave the hobby from the one statement, you know, that's not prototypical than from any other statement made. Um, and that's usually when someone's viewing someone else's layout or model and they're pointing a finger finger at the at whatever and saying, you know, that's not prototypical. So Jim, Jim wanted to show some things that are prototypical we don't always think about. And I don't remember at all what his speech was, so I'm going to make up my own as we look at the picture. So bear with me. Um, he wanted to look at Midwestern small town coaling operations. And as I said, he's got access to a lot of NP photos uh, ranging from the Twin Cities clear out to the West Coast. And I don't know, I don't remember where this photo was taken. It says reservation on the signboard. So wherever reservation is, but, um, and the numbers are from the MP people, they were marking stuff. But notice we got a, a gondola here and we got a couple of trucks. And if we zoom in, we see a fellow is up there. What they've got is a gun of coal and they're shoveling it from the gun into these trucks. And these trucks are fairly early. We're probably looking to tw at the twenties, uh, maybe the early thirties here. And these, you know, the littlest industry, you just got a little spur or a piece of track. It could even be a team track. You park a gun there with a load of coal and, and put a truck there next to it. And suddenly you've got someone un unloading their, their coal, maybe taking it back to their, their coal dealer building or pile or whatever, or, or they're delivering to homes or businesses. I don't know, but it, it's an example of a very tiny industry that doesn't need a big building or structure just to piece of track long enough to fit a 40 foot gun. So here's another example. As you can see, this is a very busy interlocking with looks like three different railroads all coming together. But off here to this side, we got a track. We got a derail on the track. We got two guns, one's full of coal. And there's some sort of a, a coal unloading apparatus here being used for shoveling the coal out into these waiting bins. Uh, probably what we've got is a some sort of a lumber yard or coal yard right here in the apex of. I'm sure glad I'm not scratch building track anymore. Oh, <laughs> so um, he gives in, uh, gets it a little bit into, you know, commenting on bits of history, statistics that he's going to share, methods of transportation, cars, why that's important, building locations, posters, a model, and some credits. So this is what his presentation is going to be. So. Let's move on. Um, Jim digs a lot of stuff out of the MP archives. This is a letter dated 1941 to a Mr. Bauer regarding a letter in November 18 to a line between St. Paul and Duluth. Uh, we'll quote part of it. Part of the northern, important part of the Northern Pacific Railway system. We say that it might be considered indispensable part to flow of traffic over this line is predominantly southbound consists mainly of coal moving from the head of the lakes to destinations in Minnesota, North, South Dakota, and Iowa. Other commodities of importance moving in, direction, in this direction are petroleum, flour and feed, cement, pig iron, automobiles, lumber and newsprint paper, and iron and steel. The northbound traffic consists largely of grain and grain products, petroleum products, livestock, fresh meat, scrap iron, etc. In addition to the Northern Pacific, the Milwaukee operates over the line uh, under joint facility arrangement. Um, traffic density quite substantial. So, and, uh, you know, but the, the thing Jim wanted to point out, and this is basically coming off the ports at the Great Lakes up at Duluth and Superior, and the huge amount of coal that was coming off of those lake boats, loaded, loaded on the rail cars, and then distributed to this upper Midwest area. So, and here's a map of what he's talking about. Um, there were five different railroads that ran from the Twin Cities up to Duluth Superior. And the NP 
didn't have the best of the routes, but they made use of it. So, um, here we are. This is in Duluth, 1930. This is piles of coal. And notice we got boxcars lined up here, not gondolas or not coal hoppers. So this must be near the winter, getting close to winter months or winter months. They're loading coal in boxcars to keep it from freezing. Um, here is the new Pittsburgh coal dock at Duluth. Um, this is for unloading those boats and making those giant piles of coal that we just saw. Here's a close up. Here we've got a, a coal boat. You know, they, if they were on their lakes, they called them boats, not ships. You can see the clamshell buckets here. Looks a lot like the Hewlett unloaders for our iron ore. And they're dropping these buckets down in here, lifting them up, running out on the uh, framework here to drop into waiting guns or coal piles. Here we are in the Mississippi, in Minneapolis. We've got the Great Northern Bridge in the background. And this bridge right here is used by the M. St. L. via MP trackage rights in the 50s. And we've got a whole string of, he identifies them as, as USRA composite guns. So these would be a USRA drop bottom guns here. Again, we got barge of river traffic, piles of coal. We got cranes with probably clamshell buckets and they're transferring from these piles of coal, uh, either two barges to ship on down the Mississippi or into rail cars with delivery. How much coal was moved? It says more than 6 million coal loads in 1957. Um, and here we've got some statistics, 57, 56, 55. 45 weeks had ended in November 9th. So that would be basically when the lakes froze over, they couldn't deliver coal anymore. But 100, you know, 129,000 cars, a decrease from 56. Uh, but a, a de increase from 55 with 300, 303,000 cars loads. So a lot of coal coming through um, those ports up there, moving to the down to the Twin Cities. Um, coal via the Great Lakes or water, coal by rail will add $1 per ton for 400 miles in early 1950s. Uh, coal hauled via water on ships in bulk will cost much less than rail. So if transit via the Great Lakes or navigable river is an option, it will likely be used. Oops. Um, if so, you're switching. If so, for your situation, model it. He's modeling the MP, so he's modeling this coal traffic. Um, methods of transport, one rule to remember above all else, the consignee or receiver determined what type of car the shipment was made in. So if they were not set up for a drop bottom coal hopper, they would order it in a gun and it would be shoveled out by hand. Or they might order it in a boxcar so they wouldn't have to deal with trying to thaw out a wooden boxcar of coal in the winter months. Um, and it, then a balance, balance against this rule, some mines were only able to, or best able to load certain types of cars. Um, we know down in the um, central eastern part of the country, Tennessee, Kentucky and stuff, ton of West Virginia, tons of two, two bay and three bay coal hoppers. But here in the Midwest, most of the roads used um, gondolas because they just were, you know, they were more versatile. They didn't have as much traffic requiring the two bay hoppers. And, so, and they often ran drop bottom guns like the USRA. So again, the consignee or the receiver was the one who determined the type of car. They might want it in a box car or a drop bottom gun, or they might want that two bay hopper. Um, as it notes here, research, and he quotes it, well, you all guys all know how to do research, we'll move on. But he points out that the railroads operating this upper area, the, basically the five that were running between um, Duluth and Minneapolis, 1941, that by, that by 55 was reverse. The Milwaukee's fleet, 38% was gone. The Omaha Road, 38% was gone. The NP, 12% were gone. The Great Northern, 9%. The Sioux Line, 3%. So that tells you how much coal they were moving or sand and gravel, but mostly coal, I imagine, coming through those ports. Another great source he points out is if you belong to the Burlington Route Historical Society, Burlington publication, 
bulletin number 35 covered the coal fields in Southern Illinois. Tremendous publication. Um, occasionally you'll see these on eBay or a swap meet. So, so but to, he wanted to focus on modeling. Um, here we do have a couple of those two bay hoppers and we are seeing a portable conveyor. Uh, it's got a, a piece here, it slides underneath the two bay hopper. They can op open a hopper. We got a motor here with a conveyor, feeds this conveyor here and they're dumping it into the various piles at the local coal dealer who's receiving this coal. Um, here's another shot. And as he says, the Walters model got it right. If you've seen the Walters coal conveyor model, they sell them three to a package. They're bright green in color. You need to paint them a, a dirty, dark, dark black. But you can see we've got the coal conveyor here on two steel wheels. We got the other, the other part here that's sliding underneath the coal hopper. Got a fellow here who's, who's operating things. Um, and here's what it looks like underneath the whole hopper. They open the door, the coal falls out onto this flat conveyor, comes into this that mechanism that lifts it up and dumps it into the receiving bin on that elevated hopper or conveyor, which will then dump it into pole or the pile. And these are on wheels so they can be moved. That's why they're called portable. So if you're moving coal, you probably need to get a couple of those Walther's um, conveyors. I got a bunch of them. Some I've converted into corn elevators, but that's a different story for another time. So, um, also clamshell buckets were very common, overhead cranes, and this one's getting ready to um, unload a, a gone of coal. And he, the photo is to illustrate relative size of coal car and clamshell bucket. So uh, yeah, the, the operator had to get this twisted just right so it drop into the gone and get a bucket of, and get a load of coal out of there. So, um, here's a, a Northern Pacific drop bottom gone. Yeah. It's, it's no, 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 the photo says generally approved because the center sill between the sets of drop bottom doors was only 18 inches wide. This center sill down here instead of the competitors 24 inch wide center plates. So there was less load. So it kept less load from dropping of, of what was left could be swept out faster because these drop bottom doors here would dump a lot of the load but the center still, still the coal would still be sitting on that and you'd have to get a couple guys up in there with shovels and um, brooms to clean out the car to get your full full load. So um, here's uh, another photo. And what he's pointing out is these doors had, were corrugated panels so that the teeth on the clamshell bucket could ride over the corrugations and not damage or warp the doors. Um, so there you can see how the drop bottom guns work. The two doors that are over the truck don't drop down as far, but you still were able to unload and you had a set of doors on each side of the car. They were controlled by this um, rod that's got chains wrapped around it. You had a crank at the end. You could wrap this shaft and it would tighten up the, the chains or, or loosen the chains. You could close the doors or open them in that mechanism. Here's a, another shot of a drop bottom gun being used at a coal dealer. And you see, they basically have got some wood platforms here held up on by some heavy duty saw horses. They've opened the drop doors, the coal comes out. This begins to work with a shovel and wheelbarrows. And they got a whole bunch of gunny sacks. And you can see they got some hand carts here with boxes and gunny sacks. And basically what this guy's doing is he's filling the gunny sacks with coal so they can sell this people can come in and get 50 pounds of coal and a gunny sack. So how'd you like to have that for a, a day job? <laughs> so here's another shot showing a boxcar. Boxcars being unloaded, what they call the coal toter conveyor. And we got something similar to grain doors in this boxcar. And again, a fellow with a shovel and he's got a conveyor down here that's elevating the coal into this hopper for the next conveyor that's dumping it on the piles. Uh, poor photo because he copied this out of a book, but you can get, kind of get the idea. There's a small motor of some sort operating the conveyor. Here's another shot of them using the coal toter unloading from uh, gondolas using the conveyor to dump into the coal bins that were so visible on the, the side of tracks 
in so many yards or lumber yards, et cetera. And again, the guys with the shovels. So um, some places didn't have uh, room or clearance for those um, portable conveyors. They had drop bottom pits and they were covered. You can see the pit just long enough to unload two hoppers without having to move the car. Um, and the hoppers were just too close to the rail for the convenience of the portable unloaders. So they had a pit, they un, um, would open these um, hopper bottoms and there would be the, the, that conveyor would be in the bottom of the pit, essentially doing the same stuff we just saw with the portable conveyors. So you could use that, that Walther's coal conveyor and just put it into a pit. And of course, the other side of using boxcars is you had to um, shovel them out. Once they get so, you know, once, once you remove the grain door and the coal fell out, then you go in there with shovels. And here we see a couple of people shoveling out. You see a pickup back there that filled someone's pickup. It looks like another pickup or something here. I can see the tailgate and they're filling them with coal. Coal dealers and coal buildings. Uh, here we can see, um, of course, not knowing Jim's presentation, what we got is we got the Flower City Storage and Moving Company Fuel and Transfer, but we'll see a sign down here in the corner that says coal. So they're also a coal dealer. So you might go in there and order, you know, I need two gon gondolas of coal for my business this week. Could you get them delivered? And so they, you know, that's how they, they did that. So, of course, you had the big coal um, companies. There's, here's Flower City Fuel Transfer Company. This was their coal bins. And you can see the conveyor where they're unloading guns coming up into their, their covered uh, structure here, the coal, big coal bins. You can see the chutes down here for loading trucks. You got a conveyor going out here for moving the coal into piles. So, you know, they, they had a, you know, they had this nice downtown office and then they had this spot out along the railroad yard somewhere. So they obviously moved a lot of coal. So here's a typical situation where you had to track with a drop bottom um, a pit. You had the conveyor coming out here and, and this, this conveyor, you got two wheels, but they're set, uh, they're aligned sideways so they can pivot. And you get all these different pits here. I think years ago, somebody sold a model for building one of these things. They were common, particularly out east. So you had different sizes of coal in each of the bins. The other side would be open so someone could come up with their truck or wagon and they could shovel out of this bin the type of coal they wanted. So looks looks like we might also have a standpipe here of some sort so this might have all international fuel company probably was also unloading tank cars and had a pump house nearby and pumping into some handy tanks but this is a nice little cold cold dealership set up here so and you could probably modify that walter's coal conveyor by turning the, the wheel sideways and creating this pivoting cold dealer so Coal bins. This is at Redwood Falls, Minnesota, um, out of the Minnesota Historical Society. Notice the sliding doors that open up to the bins. We got a track here buried in the weeds. You come up here, you shovel your gun or your into into these bins. We also got a, some supports for an overhead structure strata support. Um, the town is. McCallsburg, Iowa had some coal bins with something similar and a friend and I have been trying to figure out how that operated, Roger Ward. So I'll have to share that photo with Roger and see if that helps him. Here's another coal um, storage building. Uh, we got a covered uh, roof here. We get, if we look underneath it, we can see the, um, the troughs, the chutes for letting coal come out of the building. Just to back up again, you, Looks like a green elevator, but it's actually a coal building. And we got tracks on the other side. They probably had a pit there and some sort of a similar lift deck mechanism as we find in the um, green elevators. And they just, but they um, delivered coal with chutes or you had doors down here at the bottom, you were shoveling it out by hand. So here's a more contemporary photo on the St. Croix Valley Railroad, but you can see the coal bins back there in the distance. So here's another close-up shot of those coal bins. And notice the, the change in the slanted roof. 
Um, this would be the track side. You might have those big doors or you might have hatches in the roof where someone standing in the top of a hopper here could shovel, open the hatch up and shovel into the top of this, this bin here. And then on this side it would be opened up or would have doors where someone could come in with their truck or their wagon and get a load of coal. Um, here's Stillwater, Minnesota. This is a photo taken in 1927. You can see this is the truck side or wagon side. You can see the track side here. The top of this box box car is is equal with the, the roof line there. Here's a later photo taken by Lloyd Kaiser of the same facility, Bluff City Lumber Company in Stillwater. Coal facility is still sitting here with the sliding doors, portable coal conveyor. There's one stuck in a door ready to load someone's truck. Here's another shot looking the other direction. Uh, at the track side. Again, we got sliding doors here. We probably had some pits here or they shoveled it out into the bins. So notice the no clearance sign there. So the coals, look, they ran the cars right up against the side of this building, mostly to probably to facilitate shoveling in. Um, here's a coal shed up in the uh, Hitterdale, Minnesota in the 50s on the MP Winnipeg branch. Notice they're selling hard and soft coal. You got the doors that are numbered, um, tied in with a grain elevator. Often your, your grain elevators were also dealers with coal. So, and this building has just got a, a standard shed roof. So they had high doors on this side, um, shovel in from the, from the gun into here, pull up with your truck or your wagon and shovel out accordingly. Or if you were lucky, they had one of those portable coal conveyors. Boscoville, Wisconsin, another coal shed. This is the track side. The track's, of course, gone. And then you get the truck side over here. This might have been the, the um, office or scale house for probably part of a lumberyard setup. Here's a similar setup. Again, the track side up here. And then here's you back your wagon or truck right up there and shovel directly in. Again, sliding doors, two styles, you know, so this one has got a off pitch roof. This one has got the standard shed roof. Track side over here. The lower side would be where you load your truck. And here we can see where it's open bins. They're now using for storage, obviously a lumber yard operation. And they put corrugated metal on the roof because they didn't want to patch it or shingle it. So close up of one of the sliding doors, typical barn hardware slide the door over this, this way and open it up. Um, coal silos, we didn't see these. Two, I don't remember ever seeing one in Iowa. I've never seen a photo one in Iowa. You get further east into Michigan, Illinois, Indiana and stuff, and you saw these. And here you see the chutes coming out. These were a concrete block type of silo with an overhead, the uh, conveyor and operations over here, up ahead, but the chutes for unloading into your waiting trucks. On the other side, or here in the middle would be the pit. Uh, unload your hopper cars here, and you probably had some sort of a uh, grain elevator type lifting mechanism. Here's a couple more examples. I doubt they're putting coal into this fuel truck, but it, you know that's the fuel come. This is Iron Mountain, Michigan. Here's Mammoth, Illinois. This is a poured concrete operation. This is a more traditional concrete silo. You can see where the chutes were for unloading. Here's a wood one. This is up in Saskatchewan, um, Canada. I, again, to see the door co-op coal and wood. If, you've ever, if you haven't been to it, the Everett Baker collection is a Saskatchewan history and folklore. Fantastic photo collection. Color slides from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Tons of stuff. Really, but this is a a coal bin that, that Jim found, um, you can see. Uh, here's another photo of the, uh, the co-op's trucks for making deliveries. Um, green elevators in the background, we probably got a lumber shed here, but again, from the same source. Um, here's one, the Dakota Coal Company. Don't know where it's located at, but notice that the truck here for unloading, this has got a um, 
similar to a green truck run, but it's for coal. It's be, be having a conveyor in the bottom here for conveying out the coal in the back. And this side here probably is a portable chute for dumping into someone's basement. Notice they got packaged coal, they sack coal, they sell charcoal, they got curb service. So they will deliver the coal to you using this truck. It's very likely that this body was elevated on a scissors lift so that it would lift up and be slanted so it would direct out if it didn't have a built-in conveyor. Um, here we can see Central Fuel Company um, backed up the coal bins. There are various trucks for, we got a pickup truck here with some sides. We got a straight truck with a bed and here's one's got uh, some sort of a scissor uh, tilt bed so they can unload the coal. Um, here we are loading up using again that portable conveyor um, from the stockpile into the truck. And you got the, the um, looks like a grain door box here, but it's for coal. Um, another industry, John says, not to overlook is your local electric provider. This one is in Stillwater, Minnesota, a nice little brick building. The, um, the stack there, they burn coal, generate electricity. Um, where I live now in Indianola, they had uh, Indianola had a municipality with an electrical, they at one time, um, I think burned coal and they put in um, diesel generators. Well, I lived in Colo, found out the electric company there, they were buying the electricity, but they also generated electricity one time. They had a couple of Fairbanks Morris diesel engines sitting and they're still in the building. I was, Roger and I were able to go in there one day and look at them, unbelievable. So the, uh, your local power companies. Um, ratios, he says, after looking at branch line traffic for what he was playing the model, says, I will need eight to nine cars of energy hauling cars, about four to six cars with coal, box car, gone or hopper, and three to four tank cars for every 20 cars on his layout. So, so he's gonna almost half his cars are gonna be related to either moving coal or some sort of liquid fuel. And he, then he notes that boxcars used for coal were rough, perfect for the older home road or offline cars. Um, here's a couple shots of um, residential homes with the uh, coal chute door in the foundation going to the coal bin in the basement. I can remember we're living in a house that had coal bin. When I was a little bitty kid, I can remember coal getting delivered. I was about three or four was not allowed to go down there and play uh, for just reasons. So and then he, uh, Jim also, he's been scanning the internet. He found some posters, the Library of Congress site. Wonderful scans of color for posters. Use your computer with something like Paint or Photoshop to, to change them for your use. Uh, he says, uh, he's got one poster I'll show you in a minute of a penguin that he cropped um, the lettering and then put in the local coal yard using paint, said it took him two minutes, then another poster with a horses and a coal wagon, and they spent about 30 minutes on. Here's the one with the penguin. Um, standard government uh, solid fuels administration for war, and what you can see is he's taken his paint um, program, basically removed that lettering, or, or probably just covered it over with a black square, and then put his, his own lettering on top of it so he could create a poster for one of his local coal dealers. Um, here's one, this is a, another poster from the United States Fuel Administration of a team of horses and a coal wagon. It says order coal now. He's, he's cropped it out of what they had there on the website. You can see that now he's, he's changed the lettering down here. See interstate lumber for all your home fuel needs or he's put a nice little square sign, Consolidated Lumber Company to give you an idea of how you can use things like posters to and pictures and modify them to create posters that you can plaster on fences and sides of barns and buildings and stuff on your layout. So, and then he, his last thoughts, credits, he wants to thank Lloyd Kaiser, the Minnesota Historical Society, um, various documents, the Everett Baker Collection. Again, if you've not been to that one, do that. Same with the Vancouver Archives. Life Magazine, Jared Harper. And then uh, Jim will be giving this at the RPM in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And here's just a reminder of, of what Cocoa Beach is like. And that's it, guys. So.
Very good. Thank you, Doug. That was very good, Doug. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I, again, thank Jim. Uh, Jim Dick. He's the one that actually put it together. But I like Jim. I've studied coal and local coal dealers, which is why I probably could talk as much about it as I did. Um, but some wonderful photos there and some great ideas for local industries, because if you're modeling the steam era and up into the 60s, coal was still a very common fuel used for people, whether it was heating homes or heating businesses, or, um, you know, there's still, even to this day, blacksmiths are still using coal. It's getting hard to find, but a boy in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, if you're modeling that time period, or even the 70s, you might have an abandoned coal dealer that might still have a few scraps of coal, but you're still going to see those bins and that old conveyor rusting away. So, and that Walther's um, portable coal conveyor is not a bad little model for 10 bucks for three of them. So, gives you some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I see Rod, uh, Ron is silent. I just turned back on. <laughs> there, he is. there he is. So, so is that one you slept through, Ron? Pardon me? Is that one you slept through? No, no. I didn't sleep through that one either, but I did not see that. It's a very good, a very good, and I'll put it out tomorrow morning telling everybody they should watch the YouTube because, uh, I, you know, I, I get the feeling that most people think coal ran in hoppers. And if you're in the Midwest, as you point out, hoppers were maybe a little better than 50%, but not much more than that. Yeah. No, most of the coal here in the Midwest, the railroads that ran through Iowa, the vast majority of them shipped it in guns because for them, coal was, they, you know, they weren't serving the mines. They were, they were working with the dealers. They were receiving coal and the industry is receiving coal. And so it was not a year round business for them. It was a seasonal business and they wanted to use those cars for other things. A gun can haul all kinds of stuff besides coal. You can ship sand, gravel, any type of commodity like that, but you can also use it to haul crates, um, steel structures, anything else. So most of the Midwestern roads, um, they rostered um, gondolas instead of coal hoppers. It's only those Eastern roads that served the coal mines that had those huge fleets of coal hoppers. So I had a cousin who uh, worked for the Milwaukee Railroad back in the steam era days. He passed away just a couple of years ago and uh, he was a, um, a hostler. And he told me that uh, they would get all their coal in by gondolas. And that was one of his jobs to, to shovel it out now, I'm sure it was uh, drop bottom, but there, even with a the drop bottom, there's still some clean out that has to be done. Yes, yes. So, so the, the inner mountain USRA drop bottom gone, beautiful model. If you don't want to go through the trouble of assembling it, a lifelike or the, the Proto 1000 series, I think Walters is now selling it. They've got a, a, a model of a USRA drop bottom gun that's all one piece with molded on grab irons and stuff. But they both beautiful, you know, really nice models um, for building up a fleet of um, coal hoppers, you might say, or coal guns on your railroad. There, there's also the old Detail Associates drop bottom gun hopper, if you can still find one. So, and, and I know there's a fellow working right now on a um, 3D printing of a steel sided drop bottom gun that had the slanted sides on the bottom, which the Minneapolis and St. Louis ran and the Denver Rio Grande ran. And he's, he's 3, 3D printing them for the Rio Grande model and uh, is working on the USR or the M and St. L one. So variations are out there. So, in fact, I think that fellow was at Collinsville, the guy selling 3D parts. I don't know when you first walked in the, the main hallway there. I don't know if Ron or Greg, if you saw him or talked to him. I, I didn't talk to him. I talked to the young guy in Iowa who was, uh, he was making the uh, uh, gas electric, not gas electric. Uh, oh, the little uh, Northwestern had a little, uh, those little square box uh, uh, diesels. 
Mm-hmm. He had some of those. That that young man was. Well, I think we talked about him before, but he's was very good at what he was doing. He's yes. different than the guy you're talking about. Okay. Because the guy, the guy you were talking about was where Plano used to be, and Plano got sick. Of the guy who does Plano, and uh, so he gave his uh, boost to that guy that you're talking about. Okay. All right. Yeah. I saw the two brothers that gave a presentation on uh, 3D printing. Is that the guy you're talking about? No, no, okay. there, there were several different ones. So he yeah. was just where the registration table, he was right across from where the registration table was. He was selling parts. Oh, you're talking about Mike, Mike Paul's, Paul's Grove. That's the um, one. Yes, Sue, yes. Yeah, Sue Parks. So yeah, I, I'm actually a good friend of his oh. wife, uh, who's a band director. <laughs> yes, I, I did talk to him. In fact, I was very impressed with uh, some of the stuff he had. He had a uh, the uh, chalks that you put on your uh, tractors and stuff on flat cars. Yep. And yep. You, and all you got to do is paint them. And I bought some of those from him. Yes, I know who you're talking about now. Okay. Well, he's been slowly working on. Uh, M and St. L drop bottom gun, steel sided drop bottom gun. Yeah, he had a lot of Sioux stuff, didn't he? Yes, yeah, yes, he did. Yeah, his company is Sioux Parts. Mm -hmm. Right. I got his card. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that's all I have. So, very good. Well, Doug, thank you very much. Next week we have. Uh, Rich Hankey is going to present on uh, the barns up in Wisconsin and the limestone uh, industry going on up there. And then with any luck, we're going to have Ron presenting on a project he's working on now, uh, improving his gas station uh, the week after that. So if you're interested in presenting after that, let me know and I'll put you on the schedule. Thanks, everybody. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Are we still at 530? Yeah, we'll stay at, stay at 5.30 for the foreseeable future. That's probably also cut down some of the That numbers. may be. Yeah, I've got my graduate class starts here at 6.30. So. Okay. And that's through December. And then after that, we can go back to 6.30. But thanks again, Doug. Great job. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.